All right, guys, so we are gonna try this again for like the fifth time on my end. Um, I apologize for all of the issues we had yesterday, um, getting online and getting the screen sharing to work. And then after I got off the call with you guys, I tried for, I actually recorded for like uh, over an hour and then the audio wasn't working. So this is now like trial number four or five um, in getting these notes recorded. And hopefully, I think I figured out why the screen share was not working in Zoom. So um, for Monday's class, we should be in much better shape and I'll put out an announcement for that. Um, all right, so let's start with these notes here. And um, the beginning part I did talk about, so if you, if you were in class, I'm just gonna repeat some of that stuff. And you know, if you already know it, you already know it, that's good. Um, so, we're starting off the unit here talking about uh, DNA and the structure and function of DNA. So starting with the structure and the history of how, how, we, um, how the discovery of DNA came to be about. Um, all right, so in your, in your chapter, it starts with an introduction talking about this dog named Tracker. And Tracker was used in 9-11. Uh, he was a search and rescue dog. And he went in and he actually was the one to find the last um, surviving person uh, in the rubble on 9-11, well, in the days after 9-11. But because he spent so much time at Ground Zero in the toxic conditions, he actually uh, developed a degenerative neurological disease and died um, prematurely from that most likely due to toxic smoke exposure. Um, so what they actually did though, was they took his DNA and they made genetic clones of him by inserting his DNA into donor eggs. So um, the way that cloning would work um, is, and some of the reasons why, uh, it's like, why would you clone this dog? Well. If you know anything about rescue, search and rescue dogs are about service dogs. They take, it's a lot of money and a lot of time to train them. And these trackers clones still had to be trained. Um, however, they knew what genetic profile they were starting with. So they knew tracker was a ver like very good at his job. So in their minds, it was, taking some of the guesswork out of, is this dog going to be a good search and rescue? Because if you put all that time and, and money into it and the dog doesn't, you know, isn't very good, well, it's too late. So that is an example of something that we call genetic engineering or biotechnology, which we'll talk about um, how we, we do this. But cloning is a, is a thing. We don't clone humans. We don't normally clone animals actually either because there's a lot of mistakes that can be made but we do clone bacteria all the time, every single day. In fact, a lot of uh, diabetes patients use insulin injections that were actually um, harvested from bacteria that were genetically engineered and cloned to have the insulin creating gene in them from a human. So we do use cloning uh, and genetic bioengineering and uh, genetic technology all the time. All right, so let's start talking here about the discovery of DNA's function. And if you remember, prior to you know, um, the invention of the microscope, we didn't have any idea what was inside of, of living things. Then you had you know, uh, von Leeuwenhoek and Robert Hooke, and they found cells and they named cells. And you had Virchow and Schwann that came along and, and added to the cell theory and said, yeah, we are, all living things are made of cells. And at that point, though, we had started to discover some little compartments within cells that we then called organelles. And in 1869, you had this guy, this guy Johann, Johann Meischer, who found a substance inside of the nuclei. Um, and that substance was DNA. And DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So the, um, you know, the, the word here, deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, if you guys remember, we do have, you know, those four categories of, um, macromolecules, nucleic acids was one of them. Um, and they were made up of the building block of nucleotides. 
All right, so DNA is one of them. Now, in terms of this sugar, it, the, or the deoxyribo, that is in reference to the sugar that is found in the molecule. Um, so when we're looking at um, the name here, all right, this portion, deoxyribo, is identifying the sugar found in the molecule. All right, so they found, uh, Johan found this, <clears throat> this molecule, but he didn't know what it, what it did. Um, he knew it was in the nucleus, but they didn't really have any idea what was going on. So then in the early 1900s, you had um, Griffith, and Griffith did an experiment with mice. So I'm gonna show you the picture first because to me it makes a little bit more sense. Um, so basically, uh, Griffith took bacteria, and that bacteria, there was like a harmless version, and then there was a, a version that would kill a mouse. And so he injected the non-virulent, known as the rough strain, into the mouse, and the mouse lived because it was totally harmless bacteria. He took the uh, virulent, or the smooth strain, of that bacteria, which was deadly, and he injected it into the mouse, and the mouse died. So these two, um, these two parts of the experiment would be the controls, right? He is setting up what to compare to, all right? So this first one was okay. The second one was not good, it killed the mouse. So then he took that bad bacteria and he heat killed it. And if you remember, heat um, denatures proteins, which means it makes them fall apart and they lose their shape. And so when you heat kill bacteria, which is basically like what your body tries to do when you have a fever, it's trying to raise the temperature so the bacteria does not um, perform as well. When he heat killed the bacteria and injected it into the mouse, it lived, the mouse was fine because he had killed the, the cellular components that would actually infect the mouse. However, all of the DNA and all of the parts inside of the cell were still there. So when he took this dead, bad bacteria and mixed it with seemingly harmless bacteria, so he took two okay bacterias, the result was that it killed the mouse. So he mixed two harmless bacterias and it killed the mouse. And so he, he determined, made a conclusion here that um, something transformed, some, some sort of uh, process took place, all right, where the bacteria transformed the, the bad bacteria. Uh, back, transform the good bacteria into bad. All right, so if you look here at this last picture, D, in his fourth experiment, Griffith injected a mixture of heat-killed S cells and live R cells. To his surprise, the mice became fatally ill and their blood contained live S cells. All right, so he referred to this as transformation. Okay, so at this point though, we didn't know what in the cell transformed the good bacteria into bad. We did not know. So this was actually a really um, cool picture as well. This is what the DNA that they extracted from the cells actually looked like. All right, and this, if you remember, we have discussed this before, but you have two, um, there, there's two main forms of DNA. DNA is either found in chromatin form which is chromatin is long and thin, or in chromosome form, which is coiled up DNA, all right, plus uh, proteins. And we'll talk more about this in a minute, but so chromatin is what you're looking at here. Chromatin is like DNA in its totally relaxed um, phase, and it's just, it's um, very stringy. All right, and that would be when the cell is just doing its normal thing. So if it's a, a neuron, the, the cell is taking a messages from a stimulus that came in and it's sending an impulse down to the end of the, the axon. 
And meanwhile, inside the nucleus, the DNA is just hanging out, doing its thing, replicating at some points, well, not in a, not in a nerve cell, but in other cells replicating, uh, opening up certain genes so that um, RNA can, can come in and uh, copy down the message and bring it out to the um, cytoplasm, to the ribosome to make a protein. All right, so the DNA is just like relaxed in this phase. All right. Um, so then when we'll look later at what it does when it coils up. All right. So now we're looking at the next step in the discovery. So Griffith said something transformed these cells and you had these two people, you know, 20, 20 or so years later, Avery and McCarty, they took Griffith's experiment, which is, this is the beauty of the scientific process. Griffith ex uh, published his experiment and then Avery and McCarty were able to take the experiment and expand upon it because it was properly um, researched and reported and peer reviewed and all of that. So they took the dead S cells from, um, from Griffith's experiment, the deadly S cells, and they said, all right, well, what about these, this S cell is making the mouse die? All right. Is it the, you know, is it the, the lipids in the, in the cell that's making the mouse die? Well, we don't know. Is it the protein? Is it the nucleic acid component? Because remember, we didn't know what the genetic material of the cell was. For all we knew, it could have been protein that was making, um, you know, an organism act the way that it, that it is. So in other words, they were still questioning, okay, what makes you, you? Maybe it's the, the lipids in the cells. Maybe it's the proteins in the cells. Maybe it's the nucleic acid. They kind of had ruled out carbohydrates already because there were, um, the, the carbohydrates were so common in so many different types of cells that it wasn't making anything unique, whereas the proteins were still unique. The lipids were large molecules, so they were like, those must be important. The proteins, some proteins are really large molecules. Those must be important. So they took the um, experiment and repeated it using just parts of the cell. So first they took the, the lipids of the cell and they, um, okay, so they decided to try and see if it was the, the lipid portion of the, the cell. So they took the lipids from the bad bacterial cell and injected the lipids into the mouse and the mouse was fine. So they were like, all right, wasn't that. Then they took the protein from the bad S cell and put it into the mouse and the mouse was fine. So it wasn't that. So then they took, they repeated it and used the nucleic acid component of the bad cell and the mouse died. All right. So um, at this point, the, so when the DNA was still intact, the transformation occurred. The R cells turned the S cells uh, bad. All right. So uh, the conclusion right here was that the DNA is the transforming principle. All right. So now let's look at the next part of the experiment, which is, or the next person um, scientists we're looking at, which is uh, Hershey and Chase. Okay, now they took the experiment and really expanded it and concluded for sure that it was DNA, not protein, that stores hereditary information. And how they did that was because people were still very hesitant to believe this. And let me explain why. All right, so proteins, if you remember, proteins are made up of 20 different amino acids, all right? So think about those 20 different amino acids as letters in an alphabet. We have 26 letters in the English alphabet. Proteins have 20. So you can make so many different kinds of um, combinations by adding 20 different amino acids together so that the uh, options are endless. All right. DNA is made up of four nucleotides. So scientists were like, okay, there is so much biodiversity. The diversity of things on the planet is so large. You know, like this, 
this fern plant here in comparison to a human, in comparison to a dog, there's so many differences that it can't, everything can't be made up or your, your organism can't be dictated by only something that only has four different letters in its alphabet. That doesn't make sense. All right. That doesn't make sense. It has to be the protein. So people were very, very hesitant that to accept that DNA was the thing that was doing the deciding on the genetic information or on heredity or on your traits. Traits had to be, um, you know, depicted or, or dictated, I mean, by the proteins. Okay. So then you had Hershey and Chase, they came along and they were like, all right, well, let's work with these bacteriophages. Okay. So um, bacteriophages, let me show you on the previous picture or on the, on the next slide, I mean. Bacteriophages are actually viruses that specifically infect bacteria. So this is a, a micrograph, an electron micrograph here down on the bottom. And it's pretty crazy how they, they look like uh, little robots to me, like something from um, War of the Worlds, if you remember that old movie. So bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. All right, so viruses come in all shapes and sizes, and we're learning about that a lot now with our, um, you know, COVID-19 with the coronavirus, uh, which, by the way, if you have not checked out what the extra credit is, check it out, because you can only, you can do a little bit, or you can do the whole thing, and the amount you do is going to um, impact how much credit you get. All right, so bacteriophages have basically this setup here they have a head and like a tail and a little injecting piece at the end of the tail so they typically come and they land on bacteria so if we're looking down here at the bottom this yellow part they will land on bacteria and inject their dna from the the top part of the, the bacteriophage down into the bacterial cell all right so that was known okay and they knew that viruses could infect bacteria. So what they did was they took um, radioactive elements, they took radioactive sulfur, and because you can trace radioactive elements, think about when you go to get an MRI um, or a different scanning, um, you, you can take, you can use like barium. So they'll give you this barium drink, which tastes absolutely awful. And you, you swallow that barium and then they can trace where it's going. Like, let's say you're getting, you know, a, um, a CAT scan or, or something like that. Radioactive dye, they can inject into a, uh, an IV so they can see blockages and things like that in arteries. So we trace radioactive elements so we can see where they go. So they did that, but they treat, they, labeled the protein coat, which is a, the capsule on the outside of the virus, the, the head of the virus, they coated that with a radioactive sulfur. And then they let it loose on some bacteria. And lo and behold, once they, you know, everything was separated out, none of the, the radioactive sulfur that was on the protein coat, none of it got into the bacteria. Meaning, the protein did not get injected into, into the bacteria. And the thing that gets injected is the hereditary information. So then they knew that the DNA inside of the head of the virus could have been what was getting injected. So they labeled that with radioactive phosphorus. And then they let them loose on some bacteria and then they separated it all out. And what was left in the bacteria had radioactive phosphorus in it meaning the DNA from inside here was the thing that got injected into the bacteria to make that bacteria make more virus parts. Therefore, um, Hershey and Chase were able to conclude, so this, this here, they were able to conclude that DNA, not protein, is the material that stores hereditary information. And that was a really, really big deal. Because like I said, they did not want to believe that in the scientific community based on the number of nucleotides versus the number of amino acids. All right. So now let's look at the basic structure of, um, of the uh, nucleotides that make up DNA. So if you guys remember, let me just draw this out or write this out for you. So if we had two categories 
um, polymers made up of monomers. All right, so our first category was carb carbs. They are made up of monosaccharides or simple sugars. All right, then we had proteins made up of the monomer amino acids. Okay, then we had the polymer lipids made up of fatty acids and glycerol. P.S. Sorry if you hear my dogs whining in the background. They want to go outside because my husband's out there feeding the, the chickens that you love hearing about so much. All right, then we had um, nucleic acids. All right, made up of the monomer nucleotide. All right, so that is what we are talking about right here. So nucleic acid monomer consists of a five carbon sugar, three phosphate groups, and one of four nitrogen containing bases. So I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. DNA consists of four nucleotide building blocks. Two of them are called pyrimidines, thymine and cytosine, and two of them are called purines, adenine and guanine. All right, so if we had to think about this like a, hold on one second here. Okay, so um, if we think about the nucleotide categories, all right, so you've got like, you know, the main section here is nucleotide. Okay, and then underneath that, you have two different kinds. So you have pyrimidines, and then you have purines. And underneath that, let me make this a little bit bigger. Underneath pyrimidines, you have thymine and cytosine. And underneath purines, you have adenine and guanine. All right, so if we were to kind of just draw this out, you'd have nucleotides broken down into that, and then pyrimidines and purines, all right? So it's just, you know, a way of categorizing them, and they're, based, they're categorized based on their shape. So let me show you what, what that means. So, oops, if we're looking here, you have every single nucleotide, no matter if it's a pyrimidine or a purine, it's gonna have a base, a sugar, and a phosphate. Now, some basics with this. The base, if it is a pyrimidine, see how there's two, two rings here? If it's a pyrimidine, it only has one ring. If it's a, a purine, it's gonna look like this with two rings, all right? They all have a five carbon, well, that's pretty, pretty rough writing there. Let's try some text. All right, they all have a five carbon sugar. So this sugar right here is five carbons. Now, if we look and see where those five carbons are, we have one here, two here, three here, four here, and five kind of off on the side. All right, so this fifth carbon is actually gonna be really important when we talk about um, the direction in which our DNA is pointing, and I'll explain that. So again, a nucleotide always has one base, one five carbon sugar, and some phosphate groups. Now, if it has three phosphate groups, we call that ATP. If it has one phosphate group, it's gonna be either RNA or DNA for our purposes, all right? So now let's look here. So here's all of our bases, okay? We have um, the four different bases here. Notice that two of them have two rings for the bases. So these two would be my purines, okay, in this column. And then over here, okay, these two only have one blue base uh, ring. So these ones would be my pyrimidines. Now I have a really weird way of, under, of remembering that. Um, pyrimidine, pi, I think I spelled that wrong. Pyrimidine, um, that is a very long word for a smaller structure. Whereas the shorter word, 
has a larger structure. So I remember it's counterintuitive. So shorter word, bigger structure, longer word, smaller structure. Um, all right, so A and G are your purines, C and T are your pyrimidines. And really they only differ in this base, all right? Oops. Okay, so some discoveries about the structure of DNA were super important because now that we understood because of Hershey and Chase that DNA was a hereditary molecule, people were like, well, how? How does it do that? Like, how does a fern's DNA dictate that it's going to be a fern? And how does a person's DNA dictate that it's going to be a person? And why can't a person, you know, uh, create as an offspring a fern? Why can a human only create a human and a fern can only create a, her a fern? How does DNA do that? So they really needed to understand the structure of this molecule. So Erwin Shargoff um, in 1950 discovered really important clues into the structure of DNA. All right, and we're going to hear him his name a lot, and we refer to his rules quite often. So Shargoff's first rule is this, that the amount of thymine and adenine in DNA and the amount of uh, guanine and cytosine in DNA are always the same. So in other words, every time you find an adenine or an A in DNA, you also find a thymine. Every time you find a guanine, you always find a cytosine. All right. So his rule essentially means that A always pairs with T. The way I remember this, I'll give you a little, a little saying here, apple in the tree. So here, let's capitalize. Apple in the tree, okay? And C always pairs with G, car in the garage, all right? So Shargoff said, every time you have an A, it pairs with a T. Every time you have a C, it pairs with a G. All right. Shargoff's second rule was about percentages. The proportion of adenine and guanine differs between different species of organisms. So basically, if I were to make like a chart, which I can't really do on here, but if I were to make a chart and say, okay, let's say the percent of adenine, the percent of guanine, the percent of thymine, and the percent of cytosine in different animals. So let's say humans, fern, dog. I can't write that. All right, so what he basically said was that in humans, you know, we could have 20% of our DNA would be adenine. Now you can, you can solve some of this without even trying here. All right, if 20%, and this is important, you'll see questions like this on, on tests and stuff. All right, if 20% of my DNA is adenine, and A always pairs with T, well then that must mean that 20% of my DNA is thymine because I never have an A without a T, all right? So then together that would be 40%, and 100% minus 40 means I have 60% left unaccounted for. But C and G have to be equal. So I would say 60 divided by two, and that would mean 30% guanine and 30% cytosine, all right? But then let's say I'm talking about a fern, that might have 5% adenine and 5% thymine, again, those must match. And then the C and G, well, five plus five is 10, 100 minus 10 is 90, 90 divided by two, 45 and 45. And then let's say that these were, you know, uh, 15, 
15. So that would be 30%. 100 minus 30 is 70. 35. 70 divided by 2 is 35. Oops. So basically, if you were to make a chart and compare organisms, Shargoff found that the number of bases in each, the proportion of bases in each organism differs. All right, so, so that's what's making organisms be different from each other is the proportions of their DNA. All right, now a really important person that I always, always mention, I'm gonna actually drag this picture up here. Um, because, so, this first person here, her name is Rosalind Franklin. So Shargoff said these things about the bases, but they still didn't know what this molecule looked like. So you had these two guys, Watson and Crick, who are right here, okay, these British men, and they were working on the structure. And then there was this woman, Rosalind Franklin, and she was working on the structure. And Rosalind Franklin, I want you to kind of rewind in your brains to the 1950s in science for women. All right, if you've ever seen the movie Hidden Figures, that's an excellent movie while you're home on your uh, COVID break, you can take a look at that movie. It's a really great movie. So that's about not only women in science, but African American women in science in the 50s. And it's shocking that that was our history. And we still have some, uh, you know, ways to go with a lot of in, in a lot of aspects. But women in general were not taken seriously in science. Um, and were often would would publish papers and then their boss who was a man would put the name on it and they wouldn't you know necessarily get any credit for it and we kind of see this with is what happened with Rosalind Franklin she discovered the structure of or the shape of um and dimensions of the DNA molecule and she did it with this picture so she did something called x-ray crystallography where she basically worked with shooting x-rays at things all day to be able to determine their shape. And I want you to picture that you're standing at the top of the DNA molecule and you're like looking down and you're seeing, um, you know, a ladder. If you were to take a ladder and twist it, like standing at the top of a spiral staircase, you would see all of these, like an X shape because all of the rungs would be going back and forth. So, um, she found this, this shape and dimensions of the DNA molecule. Now, unfortunately, her work was stolen um, by her, I believe it was her kind of like um, partner almost in the lab um, who, who wasn't a big fan, all right, because she was a woman and he was like, well, I know better. He gave her work to these two other men, Fran, uh, Watson and Crick, because he knew that they were working on the shape of DNA. And he was like, oh, I happened to stumble upon this. So Rosalind Franklin didn't get her credit. Watson and Crick published this without giving her much credit. And they actually received the Nobel Prize for their contribution to science. And unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin had already passed away um, when they received their Nobel Prize, and Nobel Prizes are not awarded posthumously, meaning after you die, she actually died. She's like a science martyr. She died from her work with x-rays. She died of cancer in her, um, I believe, cervical cancer in her late 30s because she was working with x-rays all day long, and probably they did not have the um, information then that we do about the risk of cancer with x-ray exposure. So, she actually did not receive her credit, um, which is why we always really talk about her now because, you know, she contributed a huge missing link to the uh, discovery of the shape and, and structure of DNA. And unfortunately, in scientific books, you know, based on just the Nobel Prizes, she, she was not awarded that. Um, so we always mention her here. All right, so Rosalind Franklin did the X-ray crystallography, found the dimensions and shape of the uh, DNA molecule, and we call it an alpha helix which for our purposes, a lot of the time, we refer to it as a double helix. Um, double helix, which just basically means it's got two strands wound around each other and they have cross bridges. And those cross bridges are those bases that we talked about. Um, 
All right, so this was the final piece of information James Watson and Francis Crick needed to build their model of DNA. They actually, so they, they were these two young guys and they were actually seen in the community as being quite arrogant. Um, you know, just, just so you know what the, the history was there. Um, but they um, made their model of DNA, which is actually shown right here, out of like cardboard toothpicks, um, start, uh, I'm sorry, from um, little paper uh, ball structures. I mean, they, they made this thing out of very rudimentary objects and then published quickly, kind of skipping some peer review actually, they published and um, had the, the structure of DNA. And this was a really big deal. So what they said was right, you know, the, the important part here is um, this DNA molecule consists of two nucleotide chains or strands running in opposite directions and coiled into a double helix and that base pairs form on the inside of the helix held together by hydrogen bonds. And if you remember about hydrogen bonds, they are weak individually, but strong together. So the DNA molecule is two halves put together with uh, glue that's kind of like weak glue in, in terms of you know other glue. It's the weaker of the bonds. Um, so here again is their structure. Now if we actually look at it, here is what we typically refer to it as. You have the double helix. All right, so you've got the, the top of the molecule here, and then you have this going all the way down. And you see that this pink strand and this blue strand intertwine throughout the whole way. Now we typically refer to things, to the DNA molecule as a, as a twisted ladder, all right? and it's got rungs going across. And those rungs would be the bases, and the sides of the ladder would be the uh, sugars and phosphates. So if we kind of take a look here, all right, see how you have, this is one nucleotide. And that one nucleotide has a base, a sugar, and a phosphate. So sugar phosphate base, sugar phosphate base. So that's one nucleotide. Here is another nucleotide. Now notice how the yellow circle on the left nucleotide is pointing up. And the yellow circle on this one is pointing down. That is what they mean by running in opposite directions. We actually call this, we say that they are running anti-parallel, kind of like the when you're driving on, on the highway, uh, you know, on a road, like two lane road, how cars are coming this way and other cars are going that way. That's how the DNA molecule is actually arranged. And remember I said that those five carbons would be important. Here's how we look at this. All right, so if we look at the the five carbon, if I kind of zoom this in a bit. All right, see that fifth carbon there? It's pointing, it's at the, it's at the, if you're looking at the sugar, because it's part of the sugar, it's on the bottom of the sugar. All right, and then if you look at, at it on this side, the five carbon in re relation to the orange sugar, it's at the top of the orange sugar. So this side of the molecule is pointing, the fives are pointing down. This side of the molecule, the fives are pointing up. All right, and that's what that means. So the sides of our ladder are the sugars and the phosphates, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. Connected to each one sugar is one base. So notice here your A and your T are bonded because apples are in the tree, cars are in the garage. Now that doesn't mean you know, you can have a C on this side and an A on this side. It's not like A's are only on the, the right side of the molecule. No, they can go on either side of the molecule, but they're just, A is always bonded with T on the op, you know, opposite of it. Now notice something else here. A and T are always bonded with two hydrogen bonds, okay? Whereas cytosine and guanine are always bonded with three hydrogen bonds. So the way I remember this is A and T have two, 
So AT2 and CG3. CG3 rhymes, so that's the way I remember it. AT2 and CG3. All right. Um, so this is the basics of the DNA molecule. Now, if we were to draw this out like this every single time with all these molecules in here, it would take us forever. So what we do instead is we just simplify it and we just use, we just draw the sides as like straight lines. And then we, um, we draw the, the inside rungs as just letters. All right. So let me show you what that means. So here is how we would draw it out. All right, so if we're looking here, this right here, this is a side, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. This is another side, sugar phosphate. Now you can actually go through and think about it. You know, this, this base is connected to um, a sugar. The bases are always connected to a sugar. So this would be like sugar there, phosphate in the middle, sugar here, phosphate in the middle. And that's how that molecule on the outside would be. All right. Um, <clears throat> so if we're looking, when we look at a molecule, when we see across, you know, the like the C and the G here, um, or the, the A and the T here, all right, this is one, these are each one base pair. All right, and we call the bases in those base pairs complementary. Now notice the way that this word is spelled. It means complete, not like it's complementing each other. Like, hey, you look nice today. It's actually completing each other. So complementary base pairs explain Chargoff's first rule. In all DNA, the same amount of A and T are there and the same amount of C and G are found. And this is really important, all right? The sequence, the DNA sequence is the, of the base pair encodes genetic information. So basically what that's saying is the, the order of the letters in the sequence is what makes an organism unique. So in other words, if I think about the letters TCA, all right, I, could spell, in the English language, I could spell a few words out of that. I could spell act, I could spell cat, I could spell like tack, like tic-tac-toe, all right? I could spell different words using the same three letters. So depending on the sequence of those letters, that is what the word, how the, the word is, um, you know, the meaning of the word is gonna be different. So the sequence of the same letters makes a different word. The sequence of the same four bases makes different um, genetic information. All right, so I could have TGAGG, or I could have TGACG, and that could be a different protein altogether that is gonna be made from that. All right, so that is a really important thing to remember because that is what makes all these living things that we have in the world uh, possible. All right, so let's take a look at our next concept. Whoops, what did I do? Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk specifically about how DNA is in eukaryotic cells. So if you guys remember, eukaryotic means that it has a nucleus, all right? So we're not specifically talking about bacteria at this point because those are prokaryotic. All right, so DNA in a eukaryotic cell nucleus is organized as one or more chromosomes that differ in length and shape. So if you remember, chromosomes are, they are a structure that consists of DNA and associated proteins, and it carries out part, carries part or all of a cell's genetic information. So if we had to think of DNA as it's multiple uh, forms, so you have chromatin, and then you have uh, chromosomes. All right, if we look at DNA in chromatin form, it's like that picture of like the cotton ball looking thing. It's just a big ball of string, okay? Now, in a chromosome form, 
we take that ball of string and we tightly coil it. All right, and it's coiled and coiled, coiled around proteins, and you get a nice, compacted, condensed structure. All right, that's a chromosome. All right, and how you condense it is think about thread. If you had a spool of thread or a yo-yo and you pulled the string or the thread all out, you'd have a big mess on your hands. But if you take it and you coil it around something, then you have a nice condensed compact area. So that's what DNA does. And the area that it condenses or the things that it condenses around are protein. All right. So <clears throat> all the, another picture shows this a little bit better. But so during most of the cell's life, um, Oops, let me select. During most of the cell's life, it is in a chromatin structure. All right. So um, each chromosome consists of only one DNA strand during that time. So most of the time, the DNA is just like you get um, one copy of it. You have one copy of all of your chromosomes, essentially, is what that's saying. But when a cell is going to prepare to divide during division for us, we call mitosis or meiosis, depending on what kind of cell it is. Um, all right, that's what cell division is. It duplicates all of its chromosomes so that both offspring receive a full set. Because essentially what's gonna happen is you're gonna have one cell and that cell is gonna have uh, it's going to give way and when it does mitosis or meiosis, well, let's say mitosis for, for uh, normal purposes, it's going to give way to two new cells, all right? So whatever you have in that original cell, you're going to want to have two copies of it. So like during the normal cell's life, it just has one copy. Let me do that in a different color. It just has one copy of um, of the DNA, all right? But if it only had one copy, then when it's separated into two cells and split, then each of the baby's cells would only have half of a, a genetic profile. So what is gonna happen is you're gonna go through a process known as uh, DNA replication, okay? And when you do DNA replication, you're gonna take that whole chromosome and you're gonna copy it, and now each uh, baby cell is gonna have some of the new and some of the old chromosome, all right? So um, during most of the cell's life, each chromosome consists of a DNA strand. When the cell's preparing to divide, which isn't until like a certain point in its life, um, then it, the DNA is gonna duplicate each duplicated chromosome has two DNA strands, which we call sister chromatids, I'll show you in a second, attached to one another at the centromere. And each duplicated chromosome consists of two long filaments bunched together into a characteristic X shape. So here is uh, the picture of this. So this um, on the left here, where it shows the single or unduplicated, we usually, I usually refer to this as a singular chromosome. All right, um, it's just one strand because that's just all you need. You only see this X-shaped chromosome when the cell is going to prepare for mitosis or meiosis. So then what's gonna happen is if, if that's the original one, is this strand here, Oops. If the original is this strand here, your body's going to make a, a photocopy of it, and it's going to, the cell is going to make a photocopy, and it's going to stick the photocopy in red. It's going to stick to the original one, which is now in blue. All right. And that area in the middle where they connected to each other, think of it like a staple, that's called the centromere. And we call these two exact copies, we call them sister chromatids. They're connected at a centromere. Now the confusing part is that this is a chromosome and this is a chromosome. This one's just a singular chromosome and this one's just a duplicated chromosome, all right? This duplicated chromosome has double the genetic information of the singular one, 
Okay. So race. Okay. So chromosome structure, each filament consists of a coil of DNA wrapped around spools of proteins called histones. Each DNA histone spool is called a nucleosome. So that's just a vocab word there. The smallest unit of chromosomal organization in eukaryotes. And then the DNA molecule consists of two strands twisted into a double helix. So this honestly makes the most sense if you look at a picture, in my, in my opinion. All right, so let me erase my crazy drawing here. Um, if we look at this picture, it makes more sense. So we're starting off with the double helix that we learned about. So down on the bottom, you see all of your, you know, you have your sugars and your phosphates and your bases. They even have their A's and T's and C's and G's on there to show you, um, you know, your A and your T are bonded with two hydrogen bonds and your C and your G are bonded with three hydrogen bonds and the bases are connected to the sugars and, and all that. So you have that. That's the DNA double helix. So that's the first form. The two strands of DNA molecule form a double helix, okay? They correspond with the numbers. That starts twisting around normal, double helix. But then at regular intervals, the DNA molecule in blue here wraps around a core of histone proteins. So that's a vocab word, histones. All right, see these like they're like little yo-yos and the, th the spool uh, or the thread just wraps around, the thread of DNA just wraps around those histones. And that's going to happen every few, you know, few hundred bases or so. The DNA and proteins associated with it twist into a fiber. So now you start getting these um, little bub, you know, little nucleosomes they're called, okay? which are the little histones with the, th the DNA thread around it. And those nucleosomes are gonna start to coil up even tighter into a fiber. So you can actually see these here on these electron micrographs, okay, showing you how it looks as a um, nucleosome thread and as a fiber. And see how it's getting much more condensed. Then you, you get to, so it says the fiber packs further into a hollow cylinder. So now it starts like coiling into, if you've ever seen like an old school phone cord or like an, if you work in an office, if you have a phone that's actually like a landline phone, how it has a phone cord. That's the, the, the setup here. It's hollow in the middle, but it coils around. And then at its most condensed, a duplicated, so it would pack into to, uh, one if it's a singular, when it does DNA replication, then you would have the second half here. Um, duplicated eukaryotic uh, chromosome has an X shape. The structure consists of two sister chromatids attached at a centromere. So the centromere is this region here. So like, you know, this would be one, sh one copy of the DNA and this would be the other copy of the DNA. And, and you can imagine when we talk about mitosis that those are gonna get ripped apart and each baby cell is now gonna have one exact copy. All right, so if we look at it again in this picture, so electron micrographs show a duplicated chromosome, a fiber, and a nucleosome, uh, the nucleosomes over on the right side. Um, so I think that those are really cool pictures. Um, I mean, the, look at that chromosome. It looks like, it looks like a pair of fuzzy socks, right? Um, but those are actually what they look like, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, the total number of chromosomes in a eukaryotic cell is what we call the chromosome number. And it's characteristic of species. So for example, humans, humans here have um, 46 chromosomes. All right, but I believe an eggplant has 92 chromosomes. All right, so, um, the number of chromosomes does not correspond at all with the complexity of the organism. Um, I think a fern has like 1,048. I don't know why I know that number, but that's just a plant, right? Um, so the number of chromosomes doesn't correspond with, with um, any complexity of the organism. However, it does correspond with your species. So if you have 46, you are 
um, you know, you are human. If you have 48, I believe, I believe it's 48 is a chimp. Okay, very close in our um, chromosomal number. It's either 44 or 48. Um, but so you have 46 chromosomes if you're a human. Now you could have missing one or have an extra one, but that would be a chromosomal mutation, which we'll talk about, which is abnormal. All right. Now our 46 chromosomes um, are arranged in 23 pairs. So to best show you this, I'm going to show you on the next slide. This here is something that we call a karyotype. All right, so karyotype. And this would be very useful. It's like a map, a chromosomal map, all right? We have two copies of chromosome one, and uh, the genes on chromosome one are unique from the genes on any other section or any other gene uh, or chromosome we have. So if we look at just a chromosome here, so let me see, I'm gonna draw out like a chromosome. So like, let's say um, that that's chromosome number one. I'm just expanding it a little bit. Um, genes are actually sections on a chromosome. So when we hear about genes, like, oh, your genes decide, blah, 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 what is a gene? Well, a gene is just a section, could be big, could be small, could be really small. All right, a gene is a section on a chromosome. So gene is a section of a chromosome. So, or a one sequence of DNA. So it's just a small sequence, a small piece of your, of your DNA. So, um, you know, chromosome one, look at how big it is in comparison to the other, the other chromosomes. It's pretty large. Uh, they, the karyotypes put um, the, the chromosomes in size order. So chromosome one is your largest chromosome. It's got a lot of genes on it. All right, you have one copy from your mom and you have one copy from your dad. So all of these chromosomes, you've got one copy from mom, one copy from dad, all right? And that's why you have two, um, two in each pair. So we have 23 pairs. If you count them, you know, you see one through five, six through 12, 13 through 18, 19 through 22. Well, what happens here? All right, X and Y, those are different, okay? So these chromosomes here are known as your sex chromosomes. And those are the ones that determine your uh, biological gender. Okay, so these are, it is the 23rd pair, but we, uh, on a karyotype, it do, doesn't usually write the number 23 because they could be different. Notice there's nothing here for the Y. If I had, um, if I was a boy, instead of having this X there, I would show a chromosome here, all right? So if you have a Y, you're a guy. If you have two Xs, you're female. Um, so these go in order. So we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So if we have N would be, let me see. We refer to this as we say N is the chromosome number. And we say, how many chromosomes do you have in each pair? So like if I had two extra chromosomes here, in all of the pairs, like I had four chromosome number ones, four chromosome number threes. We would say that that organism is four N, all right? But we only have two chromosomes in each pair. So we are what we call two N or diploid, all right? Um, so let's say you are a, a woman and you're pregnant and you have a family history of a genetic disease or genetic abnormality or Down syndrome or Patel syndrome or different syndromes like that that are genetic um, diseases. You might do something called an amniocentesis. Now, actually, over age 35, they usually want the uh, woman to do this anyway, because the uh, as you age, you're more likely to have a genetic uh, abnormality in your offspring because of something we'll talk about with meiosis. But so what they'll do is they'll go in, if they use a, a needle, they go into the abdomen, take some cells from the um, 
uh, amniotic sac, and they uh, take the baby cell and they put out all the chromosomes in a map in a map like this in a karyotype. And if if everything looks okay, it should look like this, all right? And unless it's a boy, it'll have a little chromosome over here. The Y chromosome is actually a lot smaller than the X's. It's more like, um, it's about the size of the 20th one, maybe, or maybe a little bit bigger. All right, so if everything's normal, it's going to look like this. But let's say you see um, an extra chromosome 21 here, all right? Let's say you see an extra one. That would be an abnormal uh, karyotype. That would be um, Down syndrome, all right? So this would be, instead of being a diploid, all right, you would have a third. And so if you have a third where you're supposed to have two, it's called trisomy. And we say trisomy 21 because it's referring to the 21st chromosome. That's actually Down syndrome. All right, there are other ones. Um, Trying to think here, I uh, believe Patau syndrome is chromosome seven. Let me take a look. But you know, look at the size of um, these these chromosomes. If I had a, a defect in one of the large chromosomes here, that um, that fetus most likely won't even come to fruition. Um, because it's it's too many genes that are being affected. Uh, you know, you have all of those genes on chromosome one. Whereas if I look at 21, chromosome 21, there's it's, it's a little tiny chromosome. It's barely got any genes on it in comparison, right? So in reality, if you have an extra set of those genes, it's probably okay. Now, it, um, you know, there's different types of Down syndrome. So you could have an entire whole extra 21st chromosomes, uh, 21st chromosome. You could have some of part of a chromosome, so you'd have a lesser degree, um, but there's, there's different types here. Some other genetic abnormalities, let's say everything else was good, but you had an, um, an extra 13, that's what it is, um, for uh, Patau syndrome, and I believe that's fatal. So you'd have an extra chromosome here, and unfortunately for, for um, Patau syndrome, it's um, usually the, the baby will only live a few days. You know, so, so really, the larger the chromosome gets to be, the more likely it is that, that you're gonna have a severe problem, because just look at the, just look at the number of um, genes that you're looking at, and, and it makes more sense. All right, so, Let's look back here. I just realized I could push clear and it clears all of it. Oh, look at that. All right. So if we go back to that slide. It says the total chromosome number, humans have 46. We have two of each type of chromosome, you know, one copy from mom, one copy from dad. So we are diploid or 2N. A karyotype shows how many chromosomes are in an individual cell and reveals major structural abnormalities. All right, so in a diploid organism, one chromosome in a pair is inherited from mom, the other from dad. All except one pair of chromosomes are called autosomes. So that was a word I can write here. So one, all of the, the top row, all of the second row, all of the third row, and on the bottom row, 19 through 22, those are what we call autosomes, and they control normal body functions, okay? So that would be one through 22. All right, and then that third pair, or that 23rd pair, are sex chromosomes, which determine gender. All right, so those are the, the terms there. Oops. Okay, um, so here you have it. If you have two X chromosomes, if you're XX, you're a female. If you, uh, if you have a Y, you're a guy, so XY is a guy. All right, so if we look a cell's genetic information consists of the order of nucleotide bases in the sequence. So I, I said this earlier, but like let's say you had your sequence was AA, and you can actually, if you do like one of those tests, 
um, they can actually tell you your sequence um, for certain genes. So you have more, more bases than you can even comprehend. Um, you have, if you were to take all of these letters of your genetic, of your genome, it's called one person's sequence, the whole sequence is their genome. If you were to take it and put it into, into a book, that book would be from like here to the moon, all right? The number, the amount of information you have stored in your particular genome. So let's say one person sequences that and another person sequence um, is a little bit different. Most 99% of our DNA is completely identical to each other, all right? So let's say though that it just had a few letters different, all right? That would be a different sequence. That would be a different genome, okay? And you'd be able to tell genetic uh, differences. If you sequence that person's DNA, you would get a genetic profile on them, depending on where it is. We have lots and lots of sections of DNA. So if this was just in a piece of what we call junk DNA that doesn't do anything, it wouldn't look like any different on a person. However, if we were to do a crime analysis, we would be able to tell. All right, so descendant cells must get an exact copy of this information. So let's say, you know, um, we're talking about, let's say this is your copy of DNA and you have, you know, theoretically you would have both sides of, the, of your DNA there with the double-sided ladder. But let's say you're going to do that mitosis and you didn't copy everything, you'd have a problem. So you need to make a full copy of each chromosome. The two chromosomes that result are duplicates of the parent. So instead now of having these all be like this, this would be like a cell before it goes through DNA replication. If I were to do a karyotype after DNA replication, what I would see is this would now be an X and this one would be an X shape. This would be an X shape and this would be an X shape. All right, so after DNA replication, you copy each, each singular chromosome and it turns into a duplicated chromosome. All right, so DNA replication is the energy intensive. So that should, that should bring to mind our favorite energy molecule, ATP. All right, so meaning we have to use ATP to do this process. Um, by which a cell copies its DNA, so DNA replication. A cell copies its DNA before it reproduces, so again, that would be mitosis or meiosis. Um, for our you know, purposes, we'll say mitosis, meiosis. Um, each of the two DNA strands in the double helix is replicated. DNA replication requires many enzymes, including DNA polymerase and other molecules. If you guys remember, let's look at this word. First of all, ends in ASE. ASE means it's an enzyme. Take a look at this part of the word here. Remember, polymers are made up of many monomers. Polymers are big molecules. So DNA polymerase is building up a big molecule of DNA. All right, it's an enzyme that builds up the polymer of DNA. Okay, so we're gonna look at a few different enzymes and you need to know what they do. So it's important to look at the words for clues. All right, so, so let's see some other ones here. Helicase, okay, DNA helicase. Again, it ends in ASE, so it's an enzyme. Helicase, that sounds like helix. All right, so, Helicase actually goes through and unwinds or, or chops apart the helix. So it breaks through the hydrogen bonds that are holding the sides together. All right. Here's another one topoisomerase. Okay. Um, topoisomerase, we'll talk about specifically, but basically, topoisomerase goes ahead of helicase and on twists the ladder so that helicase can go in and chop it apart. All right, so let's, let's take a look at a picture. I think that that helps a lot. So um, if we look here, let's start with step one. 
when the cell decides it's going to start the replication process, the first step is it's got to go in and it uses these initiator proteins. They attach to DNA at certain spots. And this, in eukaryotes, this is going to happen. This is called a replication fork right here. This is going to happen in multiple spots along the, the chromosome. So it's all going to happen simultaneously. So just get the job done faster. It's more efficient. So these initiator proteins are going to attach. DNA is going to, DNA replication is going to proceed. So the first thing is the enzymes here, helicase and topoisomerase, are going to bind to those initiator proteins. They're like a, you are here. Come, come start here. All right. Topoisomerase is going to start to unwind. See how it's it's coiled here? It's a spiral and now it's unwound. That's because topoisomerase is going through. It's like if you have a twisted cord and you just pull it straight, pull it taut. All right. Behind it, and it, this description kind of leaves this out, but helicase is going to go right behind topoisomerase and see how it's like a wedge and it's just cutting through all those hydrogen bonds. So cutting through the hydrogen bonds there. All right. Now you're going to have primers that are going to these pink things that are going to come in and bind with base pairs. These bases here were just, were just stuck together and helicase came and ripped them apart. They want to bind with something. All right. They are like magnets. They're looking for something to bind to. So the primer is going to come along and match specifically. If I had like a ATC here, so let me draw this out. All right. Let's say I had um, a, T, C on this open strand, well, the primer is going to want to come in and it's going to say, okay, I need a T and it's going to call over the primer that has a T, A, G on it. And that primer is going to, to stick to the open, um, that would be like this primer here. It's going to stick to the open bases that are exposed that match it. All right, so primers base pair with exposed single DNA strands. They start, the DNA polymerase starts at those primers and it starts adding. So the DNA polymerase is the green that's building the molecule. It's going to start adding DNA bases or um, that, yeah, it's going to call over free nucleotides mm -hmm. and start sticking them on mm -hmm. to the open mm -hmm. bases here. Mm -hmm. All right, so as the DNA polymerase is going along, it's reading. And it says, okay, I have an open A, calls over a T. I have an open C, I need a G. And it's building. See this, this pink molecule, this pink strand, that's all new nucleotides. Polymerase is going in, in the up direction. So it's going up, all right? So as it's reading, it's building this pink strand behind it. Okay, and then, so see how each parent strand is blue serves as a template for the uh, new strand assembly. The new DNA strand winds up with its template, so the double-stranded DNA molecule results. One strand of each is parental conserved, and the other is new. So DNA is replication. DNA replication is called semi-conservative because half of the parent DNA strand uh, stays with the new DNA strand, all right? So that's why half is blue and half is pink. Okay, now what's gonna happen here is, oh, let's go back here. Okay. So DNA um, polymerase, topoisomerase on twist, DNA polymerase joins free nucleotides into a new strand of DNA. Each requires a primer to initiate DNA synthesis. A primer is a short single strand of DNA or RNA. Um, that is complementary to a targeted DNA sequence. Now you're going to have another enzyme here called DNA ligase, and that's going to go along and join all these open segments here. Because um, DNA, because it goes in opposite directions, meaning like the, the um, let me draw this here, meaning this strand's going this way and this strand's going this way, these, these, um, Polymerases can only read in one direction. So like they can only read going from 
uh, from here, they can only follow the arrow. So one is always going to be working backwards. So see how this one's got to like, it does this little strand and then it goes backwards and then it's going to fill in here and then it's going to go backwards. So that's a little bit confusing, but it, DNA makes up for it. It's a, it, it uh, evolved to have a pretty good process here. All right. So hybridization is where you have the establishment of base pairing between DNA and the primer. The primer is actually not made out of DNA. The primer is actually made out of its cousin RNA. And so this is called hybridization because it's DNA plus an RNA primer. So um, it's actually all driven by hydrogen bonding because hydrogen bonding, it's, it's like magnets. These RNA primers are just floating around and they have the, the matching basis for the DNA. So as soon as that DNA gets ripped apart by helicase, those primers are going to be attracted to those open bonds, uh, those open bases on the DNA molecule. All right, so here's that word semi-conservative. Each strand of DNA is a template for the synthesis of complementary strand of DNA. The complementary strand is the new strand. Um, the reason why it does this is because it, it, it's evolved. This process has evolved because you're keeping one of the original always with you. So you're less likely to make a mistake. So you're less likely to make a mutation, which a mutation is just if you accidentally put in a, a, a base that shouldn't be there. All right, so one template builds the DNA continuously. The other builds the, the DNA discontinuously in segments. Like I said, one's going in the opposite direction. Each new DNA molecule consists of only one strand and one old strand and one new strand. Okay, there's our pictures. So here's the, the segments. So you have like the, this one is continuous. This DNA polymerase is just following right behind helicase and adding on new pieces. But this one goes in the opposite direction. So DNA polymerase is gonna start down here, do a part, go back. Start down here, do a part, go back. Start down here, do a part, go back. All right, so DNA polymerase, one of the really cool things is that it also after it adds in all those free nucleotides and builds this pink strand, it goes back and it proofreads. It's like when you write an essay, DNA polymerase proofreads, and it picks up most of its mistakes. So DNA polymerase proofreads DNA sequences during DNA replication. And if let's say you had an open A and it needed a T and it accidentally put in a G, it would go back, take the G out, put in a T. When proofreading and repair mechanisms fail, so let's say it didn't find its typo, an error becomes a mutation. And that is a permanent change in the DNA sequence. So, so there are some reasons why you'd be more likely to have a mutation. Exposures to chemicals that cause replication errors. All right, so carcinogens, those are uh, more likely to cause a replication error. Free radicals, which we've talked about, like a little toddler in a class in a in a china shop, right? Uh, which you might like a, in a store with a lot of um, breakable things. All right, free radicals cause what we call oxidative damage, and one of the best things you can do is eat things that have antioxidants in it to prevent this. That's actually what they're doing. All right, UV radiation causes something called a pyrimidine dimer, um, a thymine dimer. So. Um, it will actually take, let's say that, uh, going back here a minute, let's say you, you go tanning a lot, all right? Anytime where you see two pyrimidines together, like let's say, uh, you know, these two T, or well, just use these as an example because they're next to each other. Let's say this C and this C, the, the X-ray, or I'm sorry, the UV radiation would actually, whoops encourage them to stick together so then when the dna polymerase is reading these two stuck together it only reads them as one and so then when it's making its new strand it's going to leave out that new that new base pair so that's uh that's why we wear sunscreen and that's why we don't go tanning because it can actually cause these dimers which just means two things stuck together um, all right, let's see. Uh, ionizing radiation knocks electrons out of atoms and it actually breaks uh, DNA into pieces. So 
um, things like radiation poisoning, um, you know, uh, things that you, you'd hear about, like when you see those radiation, like um, radioactive material, that's what that would actually do. All right. So this is showing you a mutation. So let's say just one base accidentally gets changed by DNA polymerase when it's replicating. Repair enzymes can recognize a mismatch, a mismatch, mismatched base, but sometimes fail to correct it before DNA replication. So if the mutation happens before DNA replication and those enzymes miss it, then now you replicate that strand. All right, so this is the original strand, and now it has AA here. So here, if we pulled this apart during DNA replication, if I went through and I helicase went through and it pulled all those apart, now I'm going to have my mistake is now the magenta piece, and now it's here, right? But now I made a second mistake because DNA polymerase goes and reads that as A, even though it's supposed to be a T. So now I have two mutations, and then that can continue and continue, and mutated cells will continue to be replicated. Um, all right, so if I look here, this is actually showing several mutations if, that you can see in a karyotype. So when they, they would pull DNA, they could actually see chromosomal mutations in these images, they can see breakages, they can see um, deletions, like this whole gene was just deleted um, in these little sections. All right, so they can actually see these chromosomal mutations. Now, not all mutations are, are really bad, all right? Look, we have, this is showing a normal flower, and then sometimes when mutations, when you have extra chromosomes that get stuck together, you'll have many, it's called polyploidy, all right? And you'll have many, 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 many copies of that gene get, get uh, coded for and get turned into a protein. And so you'll have many, many copies of that, uh, whatever trait it was on that gene. Um, and that can actually, in, in plants and things, they, that's actually beneficial for them. Most mutations are totally harmless. Some are beneficial, some are bad. All right, mutations can occur in any cell and can alter any part of a cell's DNA. Those that arise during the formation of gametes, which would be eggs and sperm, can be passed on to offspring. So if you have a mutation develop in your skin cell from going tanning, you might develop skin cancer, but your eggs and your sperm wouldn't have that gene in them that got mutated, so your offspring would be fine. However, if you have a mutation occur in a, in a sperm cell or an egg cell, now your kids would have the mutation. So um, this, this is why when you go to the dentist they, and they do the x-rays on your teeth, they cover you with the lead vest first because, or if you get any x-ray, because they wanna protect the ovaries and the uh, testes because those have the, the cells in them that will become the next generation. And if, they, if those x-rays mutate the cells in there, then you could have issues with your kids. Mutations are often harmful, but also give rise to variation in traits that make evolution possible. So without mutation, we wouldn't actually exist because mutations is what drives, one of the drivers of evolution, the evolutionary process. So variations, what makes our, you know, little differences amongst a species, that's called variation. That's all by mutation and by selecting for certain traits. So if mutations didn't happen, we wouldn't have evolution, we would have never evolved. Um, some are harmful, some mutations are harmful, like you know, genetic abnormalities, uh, diseases that can form. For example, sickle cell anemia is literally caused by one base pair changed. One nucleotide gets messed up and it causes sickle cell anemia, which is a huge disease that can, life-changing disease for people. Um, all right, so then the last little section here is on this, the ending of the, or the beginning of the chapter, which is cloning. All right, so clones are exact copies of a molecule, cell, or individual. So you could clone just a molecule. All right, they occur in nature by asexual reproduction or an embryo splitting by identical twins. Okay, so cloning actually does occur all the time. Bacteria clone all the time. That's how they reproduce. All right. As cells develop, they become differentiated. And what that means is that they become different in form and function. 
usually this is a one-way process in animal cells, meaning they can't go backwards. Like you can't say, okay, I'm a skin cell and now I want to be a muscle cell. It doesn't work like that. All right. But we have had, uh, you know, we've tried to come up with a creative way of avoiding that, which is our use of stem cells. Um, and then it says here, reproductive cloning technologies produce an exact copy or a clone of an individual, like we learned about with the dog tracker. Cloning in the laboratory is done by somatic cell nuclear transfer, SCNT. All right, what this is, is you take the DNA of an adult, so just, you could do a cheek swab, take the DNA out of the cell, and you transfer it into an egg cell, so like a human egg, uh, from an ovary, you take the egg and you take the nucleus out of the egg and you throw it out. And then you take the DNA from the adult you want to clone and you put it into the enucleated egg, the egg without a nucleus. And the egg cytoplasm reprograms the, the adult DNA to act like the egg's DNA. The, the cytoplasm actually re-triggers it to become like baby DNA that's never had any changes that happen in its adult life. The hybrid cell develops into an embryo that is genetically in identical to the donor individual. So if you look at this picture, okay, SCNT from cattle. Um, this was Cyagra, a company that specializes in cloning livestock. This is a micropipette puncturing the egg and sucks out the DNA that's naturally in the egg. And then another micropipette delivers a cell grown from the skin of the donor animal into the egg. So now the DNA from the original, um, this is the, sorry for the dog. All right, so the original uh, cow's on the left, and, um, or no, cow on the right. Um, we took the, the skin cell from, from the cow on the right, and took the DNA out of it, injected it into that cell, and there you go, you have her clone. Now it's gonna be born as a baby, just like any other you know, new uh, embryo. It would have to be implanted and all that, but it would grow as a baby just when it grows up, and it's gonna to happen to be that exact kind of adult. Um, now, it's not perfect, and this is why we don't clone humans, okay? 20 years after the sheep dolly was cloned, SCNT still has very unpredictable outcomes. Um, few of the implanted embryos may survive until birth, and many have serious health problems. So you wind up with, let's say you make 100 you know, uh, cloned embryos, maybe five of them will come out okay. Uh, and the rest are all animals that now you have to euthanize, or they never, they never even um, developed to birth. All right, so somatic cells, which are normal body cells, not your sperm and egg, so normal body cells, are already differentiated, and the SCNT requires turning genes for embryonic development back on. So sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, SCNT has improved enough that health problems in clones are much less common today, but they still do happen. So, you know, for example, a baby's bones are growing way faster than an adult's bones. Our bones are done growing, they're just remodeling now. However, you would need the new baby's genes for building bone to be turned back on. And sometimes the cytoplasm of the embryo just isn't, or the egg is just not able to do that. All right, guys, that is the end of the slideshow. Woo! I really hope this video works because if not, we're just going to not do these notes. <laughs> um, all right, so we are going to um, pick up with our lab on Monday, and I'll make an announcement about that um, on, our, on my Warren, and we will go from there. If you have any questions, write them down. When we meet in, um, on our Zoom call next, we will talk about it and, uh, and move forward. All right, guys, have a wonderful, wonderful day, and have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you soon.